Welcome to the Wave Strength. Innovative pension solutions for a secure retirement. Presented by Pacific Life. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Christine Tucker, Chief Customer Experience Officer for Pacific Life Insurance Company. And I am so excited to be here with former Air Force fighter pilot, Michelle Curran. I have so much to share with you. She has even more to share with you. And I'd like to give a little bit of background about Michelle before we jump into our questions. So to get started, a little bit about her. Michelle, also known as Mace, which we will find out more about that handle of hers, um, has logged 13 years as an Air Force F-16 combat fighter pilot conducting a series of missions in Afghanistan. In 2019, Michelle joined the Air Force flight demonstration team, the Thunderbirds. And as the only female pilot during her three-year tenure, she flew position number five, lead solo, one of the most visible positions on the team. While the Thunderbirds, she quickly established herself as a highly visible and positive influencer for the Air Force through her innovative use of social media. She captured the imagination of air show fans and aviation enthusiasts into the world of a fighter pilot. Michelle was quite the maverick, uh, showing what it is to be a modern Air Force officer for us civilians, providing a very valuable insight into the Air Force experience and showcasing the opportunities of an Air Force career. While her time in the skies was inspiring to many, she realized that teaching others to overcome their fears and pursue their dreams was really her real passion. So since leaving the uh, military, Michelle has founded her own company, Upside Down Dreams, to bring her stories to the stage and empower women and men of all ages to overcome obstacles and achieve their dreams. She was recently named the Distinguished Alumna of the Year by the University of St. Thomas in 2021 and has been featured on The Kelly Clarkson Show and CBS Evening News. This is an exciting moment for all of us, Michelle. We're so glad to have you here. And I have so many questions. But before we jump in, let's run a reel. Michelle, thank you for your service, and thank you for being here today with us. No, it's my pleasure to join you today, and thanks for that amazing introduction. I'm really excited to dive into some content and answer some questions. Oh, that is so great. I mean, that is an incredible, an incredible video and all the work that you have done. I, I know the audience has so many questions, and I'm going to take a little bit of uh, liberty in um, kind of kicking us off, if you will. And um, I know I'm dying to know this, and I'm sure others as well, but what was your main inspiration for joining the Air Force and becoming a fighter pilot? Yeah, so I have been asked that question many times, and I think there tends to be an assumption that I saw the Thunderbirds fly as a little kid, and I was just like, that's what I'm going to do someday. Um, but I grew up in northern Wisconsin, a very small town, and I had no exposure to the military or to really aviation outside of flying commercially a handful of times. But what I did realize is that I needed a way to pay for college. Mm about halfway through high school. My parents were amazing, very hard workers, but they didn't have a college fund for me. And I had always kind of emphasized academics and so had they. So I had really good grades, which allowed me to apply to some different scholarship options. The Air Force rose to the top. Um, I was just an adventurous kid, wanted to travel the world, was just excited to do something big. I didn't know what it was yet. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I went off to college on an Air Force scholarship, but my plan was that I was a criminal justice major because I wanted to do four years of service afterwards to pay back my education. Mm -hmm. And then I was going to join a three letter agency, the FBI, the CIA. That was my grand plan. Since I was probably in middle school, I wanted to do that. Um, but about halfway through college, we went on a visit to a base with ROTC, which is one of the ways you become an officer. There's a couple different options for people that aren't familiar. Um, and I saw two F-15s, which are fighter aircraft, taking off at dusk with their afterburners mm. lit. Mm. And if anyone's seen fighter yeah. aircraft take off, it's a pretty amazing experience. The orange afterburner flame, the jet noise just like reverberates in your chest. Yeah. And I was like, forget the FBI. Like, that's wow. what I want to do. Um, and then it was just, I was very goal driven. So mm. I was like, okay, this is my new goal and mm -hmm. lay out a plan and kind of like a checklist of how to get there and started ticking those items off. And I did not know at that time that I wanted to be a Thunderbird. I actually didn't decide that until the hiring message came out um, with the applications being due just a handful of days later. And at that moment, I was like, I think this is the right time and a good fit. And I applied and we can talk more about that oh, later. Yeah, that's awesome. But yeah, wow. I, I kind of just stumbled into it is how I like to put it. Um, I love that. Yeah, goals change. And they do. I mean, it's, um, whenever you ask people, I'm sure you do the same with others. I know I do with myself, too, is thinking, how do you get to where you're at today? And oftentimes people go, I don't know. I just I found my thing and it happened organically, and that just sounds exactly what happened with you. It's a very organic approach. Absolutely. Once you found yourself in the right environment, that's fantastic. So once you um, joined, got in, started going to flight school, doing your thing, um, tell us a little bit about MACE. How did you come up with that? Or how did that handle even happen? Was it given to you, or did you do it yourself? Uh, so <laughs> uh, fighter pilots tend to have nicknames or call signs. So yes. if anyone's seen Top Gun, um, <laughs> You understand Maverick, Goose, Mace. Um, so it's given to you at your first combat squadron. It's almost like a rite of passage. It's it's a big moment in your career because once you're named that, it tends to stick with you. Um, the name might sound cool, but they're almost always given to you because of some mistake you made, something <laughs> dumb that you did. Um, so it's all your coworkers know the story and it's making fun of you, but to mm. outsiders, they're like, oh, Mace, that sounds so cool. And you're like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, but so also tradition is that we don't share exactly what it stands for or exactly ah, the story except okay. for in person. Um, but I'll give you just the broad brush idea. Okay. So the M stands for mock because I broke the mock, the speed of sound when I wasn't supposed to. So oh. I went a little bit faster than I should have in the situation and it earned me a cool sounding call sign. But at the time it was kind of a traumatic event. <laughs> What's it like to, to do that, to break that barrier? So when you're up high in the cockpit, you can't really tell. There's no frame of reference, right? There's nothing mm -hmm. passing by you that's moving fast. So yeah. it feels the same. There's nothing big that happens other than in your display, the Mach number, um, it's one of the airspeed yes. indications, uh -huh. just ticks to 1.0 and you're like, okay, I broke the speed of sound. But on the outside, you get the sonic boom and then flying fast in general, even slower than the Mach, um, as a Thunderbird, I got to fly very close to the ground into other aircraft. Mm -hmm. And so you would really get, you'd actually be able to understand how quick you're moving because you see how fast things are passing by right. the ground yeah. or the water or the other jet. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that was quite the frame of reference for the airspeed. But up high, you can't really tell. No kidding. That's incredible. That, that's, that is, um, for, for those of us who could be considered um, adrenaline junkies, I imagine that that just really just put adrenaline in your in your veins. You do get used to it, yeah. I would say, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, usually if you're getting a big adrenaline kick, something mm -hmm. is going wrong or something unexpected <laughs> is happening. But it's very brief because we train to those things. So mm -hmm. <laughs> really training kicks in and you just start doing what you're supposed to do in that situation. And the adrenaline just kind of gets pushed to the background. Um, but it was exciting no days are the same so uh, challenging exciting it was pretty awesome yeah yeah i can imagine what has been um throughout your career with the military what is um some of the things that make you most incredibly proud about um your, your time in service so i kind of have two things that i always come to the forefront of my mind when asked that question they're very different so mm -hmm. the first one is deploying mm -hmm. and being in the air to help support american troops on the ground which mm -hmm. was the mission that we were doing in afghanistan close mm -hmm. air support 
um, just knowing that you have the ability, the skills, and your aircraft has the ability to completely shift the tide of something that's going on down there and save yeah. lives is is very rewarding feeling. It's mm -hmm. a lot of responsibility, yeah, but very rewarding. And then the other one is just completely different. It's the platform I had as a Thunderbird to be able to inspire people, especially little girls. Mm -hmm. When I would land from a show and they they just saw the jets in front of them. And then I'd shut the aircraft down, take the helmet off, and I had have a braid that would swing out, and they would realize that they had just seen someone that looks like them do that. And it it was such a it was so obvious that their minds had just opened to possibilities. You could yeah. see it on their faces. It was like a light bulb going on in their eyes. So that was incredibly rewarding. Oh yes, and I can imagine you know you see yourself a little bit in that as a young girl who saw that as well when you went to the air show shows and connected to that. Oh, absolutely. I think throughout yeah. my career, anytime I saw another woman flying, even if she was only a few years ahead of me in training and I was already flying a fighter mm -hmm. aircraft, mm -hmm. it was inspirational every single time. Mm -hmm. And I think you, it's easy to not realize the impact you have on people just by doing your job. Yeah. Um, so I tried to keep that in perspective on the team when I would you know, be tired and it would be far into show season and we've been on the road a lot mm -hmm. and remember that every one of those little engagements can change someone's trajectory in life. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, it's just hard to, hard to keep that in the front of your mind sometimes when you're tired, but I would try to step back and realize the impact that I could have. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, it's, um, you were um, the, only, the only woman um, on the Thunderbirds. I think you are, what, one of five in the history of the Thunderbirds. And when you talk about um, how you show up and that responsibility of, as representing, you know, talk, talk to us a little bit about what that means. So I think in any other uh, fighter squadron in the previous units that I had been in flying an F-16, but the gray version, mm -hmm. um, it didn't matter what your gender was. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the enemy doesn't care. The jet doesn't care. Right. The Thunderbirds specifically, though, you know, your mission is to is to inspire people and to recruit for the military. And your ability to do that when half the population all of a sudden sees someone that looks like them doing that mm -hmm. is it's an asset to be a woman in that position um, to bring diversity to, to the pilots. Um, so it was a lot of responsibility because I did feel like I was under a microscope a little bit, which came with that territory of being the only one. Yes. Um, but it also, I saw it as, you know, just a strength that I brought to the team because I mm -hmm. really was able to do my mission as a Thunderbird better because I brought that diversity. You know, um, I want to dig in a little bit more on that when I think about, um, the correlation to other industries as well. But before I do, um, to get into the Thunderbirds, I'm sure there was a process in which, you know, you, got, you know, saw the opening, saw an opportunity. Um, what was the qualifications like? What, is, there, is there a training period? Is there a, you try out? I mean, how do you try out to be on the Thunderbirds? What does that look like? So I'll tell you what I went through, and then I'll tell you a little bit how it's evolved over the last few years. Because okay. when the team that I was on, we made some changes to try to improve the process, and I, I think we did. Um, when I applied, it was initially an application package of all your performance reports, your fitness tests, mm. um, your check rides in the aircraft for your whole career, mm -hmm. letters of recommendation, a statement about why you wanted to be a Thunderbird. Mm -hmm. It might ended up being, I think, just over 40 pages of documents that got submitted. Oh, no. That goes in, the current team reviews that, looks for anything that's going to eliminate you. They kind of find who who's eligible, and then you get brought out as a semifinalist to an interview weekend. Mm. Um, so to even apply, you already have to be pretty experienced in flying a fighter aircraft in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be an F-16. It could mm -hmm. be a different fighter aircraft. Mm -hmm. They will train you into the F-16, but already fairly experienced. Um, interview weekends is you get to shadow the team for an entire air show. So it's an also an a chance for the applicant to see if it's really something they want to do. Yeah. Um, cause it's, you know, different, the idea of what it's like versus the day to day job. There's a difference there. Um, but then it's also the chance for the team to get to know you and see if personality wise, you'd be a good fit. Mm. And then you also do formal interviews, um, with leadership, with other people that are already on the team where you're asked questions and kind of the traditional interview, uh, -huh. uh setting. And then from there, um, it was broken down to finalists uh, from the semifinalists. So I think 12 of us came out. There were three pilot spots available. Okay. 12 of us came out. And then a month later, we six came out for a second weekend. And then we knew half of us were going to get hired at that point. Um, so the entire process from the time I submitted my application 
to the time I got the phone call that I had made the team was about seven months. So it's it's pretty lengthy. No kidding. Yeah. So it, it's a, a stressful process. Yes. I would say. <laughs> Just waiting a on lot the of edge. waiting. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and then we actually decided to bring a flying tryout um, back in while I was on the team. So the pilots that were hired this past year that are mm -hmm. just starting show season now, mm -hmm. they actually came out to Las Vegas to Nellis where the team is based. Yeah. And they did a flying tryout, which you're like, how, how do you put someone in a jet? Because some of them aren't even flying this aircraft. They're right. flying other fighter airframes. So we have some two seat F-16. So we would put one of us in the back seat. Okay. Kind of as the safety monitor. It's like driver's ed shadowing the controls. Yes, like, yes. I have the jet. Okay, don't hit him. Um, and then they're in the front seat. And it was, you know, really a test to see how they'd prepared for it. No one was going to just take off and fly formation and, and be good. <laughs> Not even the people that were already flying the F-16. So it wasn't a test of their ability to do that. Uh -huh. It was really just their ability to prepare for it, to persevere through it. Such a stressful situation. Yeah. Um, so it just gave us one more thing to evaluate on. Um, and the new team is is crushing it. They just flew their first air show a couple of days ago, and it, they look amazing. Oh, that's going to be fantastic yeah. to see. And uh, will they be out uh, in Southern California doing an air show soon? I think they're in Huntington Beach yeah. at the end of the summer. Oh, um, okay. Maybe I'll come out from Las Vegas to be a spectator for Wouldn't that one. Wouldn't that be one. fun that to be a fun. spectator for Absolutely. a camp? Absolutely. <laughs> A little bit more relaxed. <laughs> and I guess shadowing would mean that you sit in the back seat and you shadow them. Is that how you shadow to be a Thunderbird pilot? I use follow along for the briefing, the ah, debriefing. To okay. See kind of a day in the life. And then you did get to watch from the ground while they flew. But uh, as an applicant, it's it's a stressful experience ah, overall. So you know you're being imagine. evaluated the entire time. I mean, it's you have to have that that mental state and stamina to to get through to get through that. And I think what's going to be really interesting as we compare this to how the planning process um, and the quality of work that you put into preparing for that role uh, goes for any role that we all do in the work that we do, whether it be in insurance, financial services, healthcare. Um, you know, what would be some of the things we'd want to think about um, as far as advice you give to women, um, given it is Women's History Month, um, on you know how they can approach this the work that they do the same way that you did approach for the job as a Thunderbird pilot? It really is all about preparation. Um, what allowed me to fly in that position or just to be a fighter pilot in general when at any given time, I think about 2% of mm -hmm. Air Force fighter pilots are women. So it's very small. Yeah. Um, I got used to being the only one in the room, in the squadron, yeah. in the group, whatever it was. Um, but it was all about preparation. The the first thing was having credibility to be able to do the job well. That's the most important thing. And mm -hmm. so that really didn't matter what your gender was, mm -hmm. but you are under a microscope, like I mentioned. People mm -hmm. tend to to watch your performance, which I wish it wasn't that way, but when you're the only person um, of a specific demographic, it still is that way. Um, so yeah, really just putting in the time for every single flight, every single academic test, check ride, whatever it was, I put in a ton of work behind the scenes at home, at night, on the weekends for my own uh, confidence going into the event mm -hmm. and then to ensure that I performed well. And mm -hmm. that just built the credibility um, that allowed me to go do the job. But then also for women in a male dominated career field in general, I think find your allies that could be other women, even if they're not directly in your office. Um, for female fighter pilots, there's so few of us that we kind of make an informal network. Um, and we have a Facebook group and we have reunions oh, yeah? and we could reach out to anyone in that group with any sort of question, with mm -hmm. any sort of struggle and know that someone is going to be there mm -hmm. to answer our questions and to support us. So I think find your allies in that way, but also find your allies in your male coworkers. Every squadron organization I was in, I look back on, um, I know that there were specific guys that I worked with that mm -hmm. kind of took the time to understand unique struggles that I might go through and really be there to support me. Mm -hmm. And so having those male allies was also huge um, to being in that yeah. environment. Yeah, and I think that um, you bring up a really great point is that, um, you know, allyship is something that um, if we dig into it a little bit, it's about having that person in the room when you're not in the room. Like if you couldn't be there to, to show up and, and demonstrate your ability because you were off doing, you're flying somewhere else, but having an ally that's there representing you, that is um, um, calling, 
people out in terms of, yes, Michelle is the right person for this job, or right. Michelle has the capability, has the competency for this, this line of work. Um, that is what's so key about having an ally. Um, it is that person can be in the room for you. And um, it's fantastic, though, that you have been able to really capitalize on that in your career. And I think that applies to all the industries that we are in. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the, the quality of, of preparation is something, too. When we talk about planning, you know, in our industry and in financial services, it is around planning. Uh, we're all planning um, for, um, you know, saving for college for our kids, or saving for our retirement. And oftentimes, when you're planning for those, those large life events, and even planning for a career, um, sometimes you get into the state of paralysis. You just plan, plan, over plan. How do you break through to actually do yes. and execute? Yes. Yeah, so in my new company where I go around and speak, this mm -hmm. is a thing I talk about quite a bit. Is yeah, let's talk about that. Because I struggled with that at my first combat squadron, just mm -hmm. getting stuck in your own head and yeah. you just are stuck in the thought cycle, but then you're never actually doing the thing because it's it's uncomfortable. It's outside your comfort zone. It's scary to take that first step because with the first step comes risk and mm -hmm. risk of failing. Mm -hmm. um, but turns out if you don't attempt at all, you're guaranteed that you're going to fail. So that's right. what you have to keep <laughs> in mind. Um, but one of the things I say in my keynote presentation and one of the real big takeaways that I learned throughout my career that allowed me to be in a spot where I could actually apply to the Thunderbirds and get to have that experience is that the key to progress is just having the courage to start something, even mm -hmm. when you're not ready, but just believing yourself enough to know you're going to figure it out as you do it, that you're mm -hmm. going to figure it out along the way. Mm -hmm. I think it's easy to think that people that are successful have had this like magical roadmap to life that they followed and yeah. you don't have that map so you're never going to get to yeah. do what they do turns out everyone is just figuring it out as they go <laughs> yes. whether that's someone on a team like the thunderbirds whether it's someone successful in business um so if you can adopt that mindset it can kind of take away that fear a little bit mm -hmm. and give you some confidence and then you just have to take the first step to get past the mental the planning and get into the action, the actual doing. Like Nike says, just do it. Just do it. It's yes. kind of like oversimplification, but really you just have to take that first step. That's right. Because everyone, to your point, is all trying to figure it out. Yeah. Not everyone just shows up and magically we add, you know, add water and it grows. I mean, it's it takes, um, you know, nurturing and, and building that confidence. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, to add on to that is that risk, it's a it's a measure that you can also be you can calculate your risk. And I would have, I would also think that when it comes to your career in the Air Force, that you had to measure risk every day, every mission. And um, there is a lot again, a lot of crossover into measuring and calculating risk when it comes to our own career development and our own planning development. Um, talk a little bit about how you had to measure risk in the work that you did in the military. Absolutely. So it was an assessment we made before every single mission. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that, you know, is a combat scenario, mm -hmm. that's an air show where a huge crowd is expecting you to fly, but the weather's not great. Yeah. Or it's, you know, a cross country flight where we're just trying to get aircraft from Las Vegas to the next show location, whatever it is, every single flight we would plan, we would brief it. During the brief, we would assign an actual risk number, ORM, Operational Risk Management. Mm. And we had a spreadsheet, literally, that we would just calculate. Is the weather below this minimum? Okay, you get points for that. Has someone on the team, does someone on the team have a new baby at home and hasn't been getting a lot of sleep? Points for that. Yeah. Or, you know, whatever it is. And so we'd add up all those things, and it would put us in different categories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it was medium or if it was low, mm -hmm. either way, we're probably still going to go do the mission. But at least it makes us acknowledge the risk factors for that event. Mm -hmm. And any that are unique, we can talk about ways to mitigate them. We can talk about backup plans. And that just gets that right mindset so that as you go into the mission, if something does come up that causes you to pivot, it's not the first time you're thinking of it. Yeah, yeah. And that's, um, it's very similar. We, we too, um, have ORMs in our industry and apply different rankings to that as well. But it de definitely um, ties in really nice to the whole planning component. I mean, risk planning, risk mitigation, all goes into ensuring success in a mission. So if our mission is to uh, prepare 
for our retirement or prepare for our career development, um, we are managing our risks along the way and taking that first step. Um, just an incredible correlation there. I love that. Um, I, I think that um, if, despite the fact that you, when you said that, let's, you just got to jump in, just, just do it. To what degree have you ever thought of, gosh, what if they figure out I'm not the right person? Um, what if they realize that I don't know what I'm doing? That little voice that's on your shoulder, and the voice, the stories that you tell in your head, uh, the imposter syndrome, as some might call it. Um, how did you overcome that? I struggled with it a lot, especially mm -hmm. at my first combat squadron. I was young. I was a new lieutenant. I was trying to not only learn this new aircraft that was very complicated. It being a fighter pilot goes well beyond just the hands-on flying. There are so many sensors and systems and weapons, and it's very complicated. And that was overwhelming to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and for whatever reason, that voice was very strong at that time yeah. in my life. And I was convinced that people were going to figure it out. And it actually, I struggled with it for several years, and I kind of made it worse because all of that information I needed to learn was so overwhelming that I would procrastinate a little bit yeah. because that stress that it brought me to go and look at everything I needed to learn. And then also I was afraid to raise my hand and ask questions because I didn't want to highlight how little I knew. And mm -hmm. that just makes the problem worse. Yeah. Um, for me, it was kind of a pivotal point where I moved to a new base, which naturally was just a transition point. But mm -hmm. I also realized that I was tired of feeling that way and I needed to make a mentality shift. Um, I was going to be in the Air Force as a fighter pilot for quite a while, and yeah. I didn't want to live, you know, 10 years of my life feeling that way. Um, it did go away completely, but I started to just consciously tell myself to say yes to opportunities that would come up mm -hmm. that scared me a little bit, yeah. things I wanted to do or knew I should do. But then that little voice is like, oh, you're taking some risks. That's yeah. vulnerable. <laughs> right. Don't volunteer for that right. or, or whatever it was. Um, and little by little, each time it was tough. I had to force myself to, to do that, to raise my hand for whatever mm -hmm. opportunity it was. But each one, even if they were challenging and had low points, afterwards I looked back and they were some of the most rewarding experiences. Mm -hmm. And I grew little by little as a person and my confidence grew brick by brick. Um, and that just over you know a year or two got me to a spot where the Thunderbird hiring message comes out. And like I said, I think I actually missed the first one. Oh, really? <laughs> I think this was like the last call for applications because they were due in something like three days oh. from when I saw the email. Yeah. And it was kind of like a light bulb went on. I was like, oh, I am actually meet these min requirements. Oh, I could maybe apply for this. And me three years prior, uh -huh. even if I had met those qualifications, I would have deleted that email. Right. And never, it, yeah, yeah, you're thinking, oh, I'm, I don't, I'm not qualified. Yeah, enough. absolutely. Enough. Never taken that risk. Right. Um, yeah. But just that little decision and habit patterns that I built over time just shifted my mentality completely. And that's really what allowed me to take that risk and ultimately get hired. Yeah. You know, putting yourself out there vulnerable um, is a very courageous action. And that as a, as a leader, you know, being a courageous leader requires vulnerability absolutely. and, um, and, and, and putting it out there and looking at yourself going, you know what, um, I can do this. I can take that chance, take that risk, because um, what do I have to lose? Now, as a fighter pilot, um, what I have to lose is a completely different connotation. We want to be careful about that, right? <laughs> but it's really around um, challenging yourself and, and putting yourself out there and doing something that you know you can do. And I think that we all can learn so much from that, um, that discipline to fight out the, the demons that are speaking in our minds to push, push forward and try it because why not? We can do this. Um, so this has really laid a great foundation for where you're going into your next, your next career and, uh, and bringing those experiences, those life experiences and, and this next chapter you're gonna have. Uh, love to hear about how are you are gonna bottle that all up into this next adventure. Absolutely. So if you had asked me, a, this is a trend, I think, in my life. If you had asked me a year ago or you had asked me two years ago, I would have never said this. Um, I planned on leaving and applying to become an airline pilot because that's yes. what most fighter pilots do if they uh -huh. decide to not stay in. Um, and for personal reasons, I decided it was time to transition to a little bit more stability. I met my mm -hmm. husband. I have a stepson. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
that was kind of the driving force to leave active duty, even though it was an amazing experience. Um, but, you know, COVID happened and the airline industry was uncertain. And again, that's the point where all of a sudden you have to reevaluate your plans yeah. uh, and pivot. And mm -hmm. it ended up now the airlines are hiring like crazy. I could definitely right. apply and, and go do that. But during that time, I kind of explored other options and thought about what I really found as most, most rewarding. And it was the ability to impact people and inspire them. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just the coolest thing I had done. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, how can I keep doing that? Yes. And so I started to put out a few feelers to see if there was interest in a market um, for speaking and if I had a story that was worth sharing. Yeah. And started to develop it into something more polished and more cohesive. And it was honestly great for me because it gave me a chance to reflect on my career and what I had learned and things mm -hmm. I had struggled with. It was mm -hmm. kind of therapeutic yes. <laughs> um, to write it out and talk about it. Um, and then I started a speaking company called Upside Down Dreams. And so now I'm giving keynotes and it's stressful because I am an introvert a little bit. So uh -huh. uh, it's, <laughs> really? it's right. I, I can turn on the switch. So here we are. Um, it's stressful for me to you know put myself in front of a large group of strangers and speak. But at the same time, it, I grow as a person a little bit every time I make myself sure. do that. Yes. Um, so I love to have that feeling. But also to be able to continue to impact people even after I've left the Thunderbirds, I'm no longer wearing the uniform um, in a positive way. And mm -hmm. we talked about it a little bit, but I struggled with some stuff earlier in my career and I thought I was in the wrong career field. I, you know, I decided I wanted to be a fighter pilot. I'd worked towards it for years at that point and I was there. Yeah. And I had the feeling that I wasn't good enough for the job. And I was like, oh no, what have I gotten mm, myself into? Right. But just that transformation that I was able to go through, mm -hmm. um, sharing with people that with people has been really impactful. And I've spoken to everyone from elementary schoolers up to high schoolers to uh, CEOs to executives of companies. And I, you know, tailored a little bit, but it's it's cool to see that hopefully they can take some lessons learned that can maybe make them reevaluate when they have that voice on their shoulder yes. that's questioning their abilities and they're you know, holding themselves back because they have self-doubt. So, so far so good. It's, it's been busy, but it's been awesome. Oh, wonderful. That is very inspiring. I, I love it. I love how you are able to take these learnings and so many, so many things that um, you know, we all do is, as humans is we have so much richness and textures in our lives that can be redeployed into so many other areas and um, make an impact. And it sounds like you're doing exactly that. I love it. Um, I'd love to now, if, if you're good with this, take yeah. some questions from our audience, of which one of them I know is coming up because um, I got a little sneak peek of it. And I do have to ask it, uh, what does it mean to pull um, nine Gs? Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> Ooh, okay. So Gs are, uh, one of the really unique things about flying a fighter aircraft F-16, especially and especially the solo pilot uh, profile that I flew for the Thunderbirds, yes. very high G. I would pull eight to nine Gs about three times for every demonstration that you'd see at an air show. Um, so it, it's very unique. Also, one of the hardest things on your body and oh yes, definitely does not feel very good at the time. Um, but for people that aren't familiar, G-forces, um, right now we're all at one G just the force of gravity. Mm -hmm. So I always say we all weigh 100 pounds for the example because it's easy, easy math. Um, so if you weighed 100 pounds, when you're pulling nine Gs, you would feel like you weighed 900 pounds. So it's just multiplying the normal force of gravity by whatever the number is. Um, and in the aircraft, it's from your head down towards your feet is the direction that the pressure. Okay. Is. So you're being squished into the seat. Okay. Um, and you, most people can stay awake, stay conscious. Okay. <laughs> uh, around four or five G's, okay. um, which is on the best roller coasters in the world. If you're roller coaster junkies, you might pull four G's. Um, but then we have special suits that we wear that squeeze our legs like a blood pressure cuff almost for oh. your entire lower body. Yeah. And then special breathing techniques and all of that is to help push blood back up to your brain. Because once you get above four or five, the forces are pushing the blood out of your head stronger or harder than your heart can overcome. Yeah. And so you need blood in your brain, obviously, to stay conscious. Right. So we do what we call a G-strain. It's a special breathing technique. 
um, you can look on YouTube and there's tons of videos of people. And you train for that. Absolutely. Okay. You train for it. And the first time you do it is in a torture device called the centrifuge. If you've seen <laughs> Armageddon or Space Cowboys, it's, yes. it's a metal capsule oh. on the end of the arm. It spins really fast. It, so you can experience G-forces in a safe environment. Um, but it's really not enjoyable. Your body does get used to it some. So it wouldn't. It was something I didn't even think about, honestly. When I pulled back on the stick, I just knew as the G-suit would start to inflate, put pressure on my legs, I would just do the breathing, the G-strain naturally. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about so many other things yes. that are happening. Um, but at first, before you're used to it, it is very difficult to be under those physical stresses and still focus on the task at hand and process data and react to things and fly the jet. Um, so it's just one of those unique things that you kind of only experience if you're flying high performance aircraft or maybe if you're an astronaut, yeah. but otherwise you don't really experience in, in general day to day life anything more than yeah, three or four G's. Oh, well, so you, you can't have um, vertigo. I would imagine that would be a, not a okay. good thing, right? Yeah. Uh, so roller coaster rides would be a problem too if you're uh, a subject to being uh, motion sickness, oh, yeah. that'd be a problem. Um, I would imagine that you'd have to have really strong lower body strength, like your legs would have to be really, really, really strong to withstand that type of uh, experience. That definitely helps. A lot yes. of us would do weight training. Yes. Uh, I love to work out in general, so I probably do more than required, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's something that's encouraged for sure, and it's something that just helps you. Uh, cardio endurance as well, because you're almost like holding your breath while you're yeah. doing, you're doing yeah. very small air exchanges, uh -huh. so you can get out of breath very quickly, um, but then, yeah, strong leg muscles to help squeeze all that blood back to your brain. It's it's really a strange environment to work in, right? Not your average day at the office. But. No, it's not. <laughs> I can't say that I work in an environment of pulling nine Gs every day because I, I would be uh, very, very challenging. Um, well, this has been great. I, I'd love to take this opportunity. Um, if any of you um, are enjoying this session, this is a wonderful time for you to put in your questions into our chat. Uh, we do have a number of questions that are coming in. Love to be able to um, sh um, share them with uh, with Mace here. So we do have one that I do want to call out um, from Rebecca. Thank you. Um, and the question is, uh, were were there any other women trying out in your group for the Thunderbirds? So no, when I applied, I was the only one, um, which is the story of my career, it seems like. But um, <laughs> so of the 20 something applicants, I, I believe as far as I know, I was the only woman. I was definitely the only one that went to uh, the finals and the semifinals. Wow. Um, and I think you had mentioned I'm, I was the fifth female pilot to fly with the team and the team's almost 70 year history. It's the 70th anniversary of the Thunderbirds next year. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a been a long time for only yes. five of us. Yes. Um, and the, the last female pilot before me, there was about a five year gap. Mm. So there had been, you know, quite a while where kids were going to air shows or women were going to air shows and it was all men. Um, so when I did join the team, I got asked all the time if I was the first one. And uh -huh. I'm like, no, like uh, Fifi back in 2005 was the first one. And every one of them that followed really you know, helped pave the way a little bit further. Yeah. Uh, but what was really cool is when I was leaving the team and we were hiring the next round of applicants, um, one of the applicants was a woman and she ended up getting hired. So right now, number three, uh, her call sign's Threat. She is on the team. Threat? Threat. Okay. Yeah. And we actually went to college together. No kidding. Very small world. Um, I went to college. I did ROTC at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. Yeah. And did ROTC there. And we were in the same ROTC detachment. So we were a few years. I was a few years older. When I was a senior, she was a sophomore. But I, I knew her. I recognized the name. Oh, my God. And she ended up doing really well and got hired. And she's crushing it right now. So it's our uh, ROTC detachment and our university that are are both very proud right now. No kidding. Um, but super small world, so it was really cool. And I was so excited that she was uh, hiring, and there wouldn't be a huge gap where, where little little girls weren't seeing anyone that looked like them. Yes. You know, when the jets would shut down, the pilots would get out. So hopefully it can stay that way because on mm -hmm. the team specifically, it is so important with the mission of that squadron to have that representation. Yeah, absolutely. That That is fantastic. You know, it is, um, being it is Women's History Month and you're, you know, you're setting, you're, you're, you're a trailblazer in so many ways. Um, but who are some of the women who inspired you? That's a perfect segue because I was 
you know, I mentioned the other female pilots that had been Thunderbirds before yeah. me. And growing up, I didn't have the exposure to the military aviation. Aviation, I hadn't seen an air show. My first time seeing the Thunderbirds fly was when I was at Columbus Air Force Base in Mississippi, mm-hmm. already just finishing up pilot training. I had actually just found out that I was going to go on to learn to fly the F-15. Oh. So this big dream I had had of becoming a fighter pilot, I'd just gone through the night of where they announced everyone's assignments and found that out. And while I was still at that base before I left to go learn to fly the F-15 specifically, the Thunderbirds happened to come there to do an air show. And one of the four female pilots that was before me happened to be on the team at that time. And I remember seeing her, and even though I was already a military pilot, I just found out I was going to fly F-16s, I looked at her with such awe Aww. and reverence. <laughs> and there was, a, a, I guess, a party for the air show performers and everyone that worked on the base could come to, and she was there. And I was too afraid of her for no reason, because she's super <laughs> nice. I know her now. I was so afraid of her. I never went up and talked to her. But I remember like all night I was like, oh, there she is. There she is. <laughs> and so that we ended up being friends and we're friends now. And I tell her that story and she thinks it's hilarious. But <laughs> um, at that point in my career, it was such an impactful moment just to yeah. see her on the team. And so, again, I tried to remind myself of that. Like, even people that I wasn't speaking to, just seeing seeing a woman doing that was leaving an impact. So it was it was such an honor and a unique position to be in to be able to inspire people like that. Oh, that is fantastic. That's a great, great story. We, I think there, there could be a few of us who can reflect back on um, other women who came before us. And to us, they're, they're, they're the rock stars, and we hold them in reverence, as you said. That's, that's fantastic. Well, um, look, I, I may have some more questions for you. Absolutely. Um, so thank you for the questions coming through. It's fantastic. I have one here from Paul. Uh, can you share a struggle, Michelle, or an obstacle you overcame and what you learned in doing so? Yeah, I mean, there's been several. Um, from little stuff like a bad flight, but the one that really sticks out is just that struggle in the first assignment with with my own self-doubt. And the funny thing is when I would talk to my peers, my instructors, they're like, oh, you're doing well. Like, mm-hmm. and from their perspective, I was doing the job, I was doing fine. Mm-hmm. But internally, I was sure that people were going to find out that I wasn't oh, good yeah. enough to be there any yeah. minute. So just that confidence. And you know, it's so easy to look at people that are successful and think that they never, they never struggled with that and that they have this magical attribute that they just carried through their lives or yeah. they were given and that has allowed them to get to that success and Mm -hmm. that you don't have it. So you're never going to be able to get there. Mm -hmm. Um, But I really realized as I went through that transformation from that first assignment to the point where I eventually was the lead solo that no one has that. And I I alluded to that earlier, that everyone's just figuring out along the way. Um, So there's other lessons that are more in the nitty gritty, but Mm -hmm. that is the one that really stands with me now. And that I remind myself of even, I mean, taking the leap of faith of leaving the military and seven years away from a full retirement and becoming an entrepreneur yes. in a completely unknown space. That was a huge leap of faith. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a calculated risk. I didn't yep. just do it blindly. I did some research first and tested the waters. But I realized that all those people that are standing on stages that are keynote speakers that are doing it successfully, none of them have some magical attribute that I can't get to. Exactly. And so if you can just embody that mentality, it opens up so many possibilities. It sure does. It sure does. That's great. That's great. Um, Question here from PJ. Uh, Which maneuver would you pull the most G's? Do the G's give your body long-term issues? Mm. Yes. (laughs) Yes. So first, the highest G maneuver was the max turn half Cuban. and Max turn half Cuban. Yes. So it's basically a, a... 360 degree turn um, mm-hmm. level. Okay. I think there's there might have been um, some footage of it in the yes. initial video. Otherwise, there's definitely some of that maneuver on on my own social media because it's it's very uh, visually impressive because you're so close to the ground. So you do a 360 degree turn. I would pull eight to nine G's for that, um, and then I would roll out, and then I would pull straight up and go over the top in another circle, just oriented in plane. And I would usually hit eight and a half G's in that pull as well. So it's just back to back high G. Um, and 
we do a lot of work to keep it from impacting your body long term. Yeah. Um, but it definitely it definitely does. I've dealt with some back pain, some oh, like neck sure. stiffness. Uh -huh. um, I'll be headed to the VA to see what they have to say about that. <laughs> but I, I try to work through it with you know mobility stuff, the workouts that I do. But uh -huh. it, there's just no way around it. That force on your body definitely has some compression on your back and your neck. So yeah, a lot of people struggle with that. I imagine um, doing a lot of stretching as well kind of helps to some degree, but that that impact in your physicality, I would imagine, doesn't really show up probably for years either. Right. Right. Yeah. So TBD on TBD. what the long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you you look good. You look like you're upright, which is good. So far, okay. so good. So far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ryan here asks, are there any techniques you use to help you push yourself and motivate yourself in difficult times? Yeah, so I have always kind of just been one to put my head down and suffer through yeah. it. Um, one of the things that I did partway through my career was just a personal hobby that I think built a lot of grit and mental toughness mm -hmm. was just getting into endurance sports. Yeah. Um, I signed up for a marathon, started training for it. No and kidding. <laughs> it, not even the race itself, but the, the training for it over months and months leading up to oh, it and doing sure. all those long runs, yes. just being out there by myself. And mm -hmm. you're just there. It's a great time actually just reflect on things or yeah. listen to audiobooks or whatever. But that, you know, just getting okay, being uncomfortable. And that was just a physical way to do it, mm -hmm. which definitely translated into mental strength as well. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's so many different ways to do that, mm -hmm. to find something that you can start doing that's that's tough yeah you know yeah i think it's easy especially with the pandemic and working from home it's easy to just fall into your comfort zone of being you know in your your blazer with yeah. your slippers on yeah but yeah, yeah. <laughs> just whatever that sign up for a race or sign mm -hmm. up for a, a, a public speaking course because that's terrifying join toastmasters right. whatever it is <laughs> something that gets you outside that comfort zone mm -hmm. even if it doesn't directly translate to your day-to-day you know, job that you do that yeah. just builds these attributes of strength and grit that that do help you. Definitely, it contributes to like the resiliency Absolutely. and the characteristics around that. Do you ever do trail running? So, <laughs> I I love trail running. Um, yeah, I signed up for an ultra marathon when I lived in Texas when I was stationed there, and it was a fifty k, and it was in Texas hill country, so very oh. rocky, very hilly, mm -hmm. tons of elevation mm -hmm. gain and uh, descent. And I was very busy as an active duty pilot, so I didn't get to train as much for it as I wanted to, or as I should have, it turned out. Um, so that was a suffer <laughs> fest. It took me forever. And uh, But yes, I love trail running, but that might have been a bit aggressive with not having the time to put into the training. <laughs> I'm hoping actually now with having more control of my schedule, I'll be able to get more into my hobbies. Mm -hmm. um, I really, really love the mountains and mountaineering. Mm -hmm. and walking uphill at elevation for very long periods of time is very similar to running a marathon. Yeah. Um, it's just a lot of time for you to think about how tired you are and mm -hmm. how much your legs hurt and mm -hmm. to come up with mental techniques to just overcome that and yeah. break things into small uh, digestible chunks. That's right. Which is really how I achieved everything, honestly. That's right. The closest alligator to the boat. Focus on that and uh, then yes. just deal with the next one. I love that. I love that. It's like those little nuggets, mm -hmm. just little, little incremental steps of improvement. Um, you adjust to go along the way. That's, that's terrific. Um, yeah, I'm not a runner um, by choice, but um, I admire those who take that on with fervor. You know, good for you. Um, from Chris, uh, what was your favorite air show location to fly? Uh, well, it's fitting that we're here in California right yes. now. Uh -huh. um, Huntington Beach. Of course. It's amazing. <laughs> Obviously, just a great location to yeah. be as a person, like to go out to eat and to walk along the boardwalk and do all those things. And our families would come out because we live in Las Vegas, so it's close enough by uh -huh. that it was easy to get to. But really, those over water shows yeah. are just gorgeous. And the watercolor, and if you've seen any of the videos from that show specifically, it's the aqua blue water. Yeah. And also, as a pilot, from that perspective, there's no trees, there's no variations in terrain, hmm. there's no towers. Yeah. So just having that completely flat, smooth surface that's exactly sea level really allows you to perform right at your minimum allowed altitude. And it's just such a cool visual for the people on the beach 
and the people out in boats, which is always a unique perspective. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's uh, being a, a, a spectator um, on the beach is a lot. Is, it is. It's breathtaking to watch the, the, the maneuvers, the, the intricacy of the movements. It's, it's been phenomenal. It's, I was curious. Um, when the Thunderbirds are flying in formation, like you just described, and your planes are extremely close together, moving at incredible speeds, trust plays a factor, right? <laughs> just a little bit. Yep. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> the Thunderbirds <laughs> are about the most extreme example of, of trust that I could imagine. Um, even when I applied to the team, I didn't quite realize uh, the level of it. Um, if you've seen any of the videos where we're all six in formation and we're flying a roll or a loop where we go up and over, mm -hmm. um, you'll see that the pilot's on the wing, so me way out on the left, and then you know the next person that I'm flying off of, and then on the other side as well, everyone is looking sideways. Uh, yeah. The only person that's really looking forward that has full perspective on airspeed, altitude, when we're pointed straight at the ground as we come over the top, mm -hmm. or when we're upside down, is mm -hmm the boss thunderbird one so we are fully trusting him with our safety with everything yeah and then we're also trusting the pilot next to us that they're mm -hmm. not going to make any all aggressive deviations mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and you know the when i was flying that formation i was far left side and so there was another aircraft between me and the thunderbird one jet so he's sandwiched in between two aircraft right so He's trusting that I'm not going to get too close to him. He's never looking at me because he's flying off the aircraft to his right. Yes. And so when I'm flying off of him, I'm actually looking at the back of his helmet the entire time. And if you see any of those videos, you'll never see us flinch and look forward. Because the closest alligator is that jet yes, that's three feet away from you, not the ground that's a couple thousand feet yes. below you. Um, so it was, it's something that takes time to get to that spot, time to build those relationships, yes. but also time mm -hmm. to just overcome your natural instinct yes it, it would be like walking around just staring at your friend all day and trusting they weren't going to run you into anything <laughs> you know you'd want to look forward and so that you don't run into the wall um but it's, it's something you build over time but the trust level is extreme that sure. is phenomenal um that that that's important that's just great um well i think we have time for just one more question um and that is uh from milda uh the ability to stay calm under pressure is something that is it learned or were you born with it? Maybe a little bit of both, but ah. I think it's mostly learned. I think it's mostly yeah. trained yes. into us. Um, you look at a lot of jobs in the military or, you know, any really high pressure career and not all those people just naturally were born with that and fell into those roles. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's repetition. It's yeah. training. It's a gradual escalation of the amount of pressure and a gradual increase in the task loading and as you develop you're able to take on more and more so mm -hmm. when you're a brand new pilot in the air force you don't learn an f-16 yeah you learn in a much much smaller much less powerful slower aircraft mm -hmm. it might fly 80 knots and even at that time you feel like your brain can't keep up with it yeah uh and it's stressful but you fly you know flight after flight and pretty soon you're like okay i can keep up with things i can make the radio calls i know it's coming next and that stress starts to go down once you get to that point it's time to move into a faster yeah more difficult aircraft and mm -hmm. we did that about four times before we were you know in a fighter high performance jet so it's it's a lot of training it's a lot of preparation as yes. well because yeah. i know i feel so much more ready for something so much more prepared for surprise things that might go wrong if i've put in the time to think about that stuff in advance and prepare for it and lay out a plan if that scenario does happen mm -hmm. and so just knowing i have the tools the skills the training to deal with whatever's going to happen yeah i can just put that out of my mind and if it happens i'm ready for it but i can focus on the task at hand that's the process that's great thank you thank you so much Absolutely. for sharing your story and looking so forward to seeing you um on the stage going forward um and your inspiring talks and your social media channel channel i love i love the videos i love your stories love your family stories so much enjoying it and um and thank you very Absolutely. much thank you Thanks, for your Christy. service appreciate you here. so much thank you thank you all so much for joining us today i hope you enjoyed our session 
And please uh, go to our YouTube channel uh, for the Wave Strength here at Pacific Life. And thank you all for your time and attention. We'll see you next time. This has been another episode of The Wave Strength, presented by Pacific Life. Don't forget to catch us on YouTube and make sure to subscribe. Although this is presented by Pacific Life, the opinions and views expressed are those of the hosts and participants and do not necessarily reflect Pacific Life's views on any of the topics discussed. Pacific Life is a product provider. It is not a fiduciary and therefore does not give advice or make recommendations regarding insurance or investment products. Pacific Life, its affiliates, its distributors, and respective representatives do not provide any employer-sponsored qualified plan administrative services or impartial advice about investments and do not act in a fiduciary capacity for any plan. Pacific Life refers to Pacific Life Insurance Company, Newport Beach, California, and its affiliates, including Pacific Life and Annuity Company. Insurance products are issued by Pacific Life Insurance Company in all states except New York and in all states by Pacific Life and Annuity Company product availability and features may vary by state. Each insurance company is solely responsible for the financial obligations accruing under the products it issues. This was recorded on March 29th, 2022.